island is tucked away to one side of the upper bay, where the ships sail in and out in the shadow of the skyscrapers. It's only a has-been of the harbor now. The ships ignore it as they come and go. Even New Yorkers sometimes ask, what's that? What's that place over there? Once, millions who never saw it knew its name and what it was. There were different names for it. It was called the Gateway and the Golden Door. And it was also called the Island of Tears. In all the world, there has never been a place quite like it. There will never be again. It's empty and forsaken now. Nobody comes here anymore. Its day is done, its glory gone. But there's an epic island, an island of epics. Twenty men and children passed through here on one of the great American adventures, perhaps the greatest. You are part of their story, and so am I, because their coming changed your America. Island called Ellis. first is the silence, the kind of haunted stillness which comes only to places that once were noisy with human life, to ghost towns, lost cities. One of the great mass movements of history surged through here, and now, not a sound. feel to the place, an atmosphere. The past keeps crowding in, what the historians call the oldest and most persistent theme in American history, immigration. They came here from the ends of the earth on an age-old quest. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if you follow their footsteps through these halls and corridors, you can still sense their presence. You can sense it somehow in the very vacancy of the place. It leaps at you from the scattered and forgotten clues they left behind to mark their passage. A walk through Ellis Island is a journey into the American past.
Somebody once said, America wasn't discovered by Americans, and he was right. But the wonder is that America was discovered so many times, over and over and over again, by one generation of explorers after the other. Explorers who came to stay, immigrants. Just a stone's throw across the water on Ellis's sister island stands their symbol. And she's an immigrant too. She came from France a long time ago and she's been welcoming other immigrants ever since. In the sonnet chiseled on her base, she says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That was the poetic way of putting it. But even earlier, a popular American ballad was saying the same thing in a more jaunty way. Of all the mighty nations in the East or in the West, this glorious Yankee nation is the greatest and the best. We have room for all creation and our banner is unfurled. Here's a general invitation to the people of the world. So they came, and the ferry boats took them from their ships and brought them directly to Ellis Island. pilgrims and babushkas and derby hats who brought along more than their nondescript bags and bundles. They brought with them the color and character and ferment that was making America the most richly diversified country ever known, a nation of nations. Ellis was the doorstep, the threshold, the gateway, and the gatekeepers had to learn to say, step lively in every language of the earth. We were simply swamped by that human tide, an old Ellis hand recalled. It was a tide that crested at the turn of the century, a million in 1905, another in 1906, and more than a million in 1907, the peak year. And still the ships kept coming. The voyage over was something no immigrant would ever forget. They came packed into the steerage like cattle, often without enough food and water to last out the six weeks and more of the crossing. Crammed into foul and verminous quarters, many sickened, many died. Coffin ships, they were called. But what the immigrants were leaving seemed infinitely worse than what they were facing. They were fleeing from famine and poverty and political persecution. They were seeking a future of opportunity and hope and freedom. And one of them said, I would rather cross the Atlantic 10 times than hear my children cry for food once. Homeless and tempest-tossed, the summit on the statue called them. But they were sharing an experience that stretched back 300 years. The Mayflower, too, had carried common people who made an uncommon decision. Now, waiting their turn to land, the old was behind them, the new was beginning. Millions first set foot on American soil here, on the island named for a New Jersey farmer, Samuel Ellis, who once owned it. Long ago, it was called Gibbet Island, when a pirate was hanged here. And it still seemed ominous to the immigrants. One of them, Stoyan Christo from Macedonia, remembered, the ground swayed from the motion of the boat as we shuffled along toward the forbidding brick building. It was a purgatory we had to pass through before we could enter America. We wound through many corridors, not knowing where we were going or what would happen to us. Then, I remember, we entered a large hall it was big enough to hold everybody in my entire village back home and all their country relatives and all their cows besides. It was immense. It was awesome. This was the purgatory place, the registry hall. Every immigrant who landed at Ellis had to pass through it, and this is where his fate was decided. 
Today, all the emptiness and silence of Ellis Island seems concentrated here. But once it was jammed and packed and thronged from morning till night, as many as 5,000 immigrants passed through it every day. An official called it an enormous trough, continually filling up at one end and emptying out at the other. This is where the two sentences that changed the lives of millions were spoken. You may go on, or you are rejected, you must go back. They had to run a kind of gauntlet here, an obstacle race in which America itself was the prize. They were herded from one official desk to another, from one inspector to the next. All day long, the inspectors would call out the names of the immigrants in turn, and somebody said it sounded like roll call at the Tower of Babel. And if you listen, you can still catch the echoes of that roll call. You may hear the reverberation of a name you recognize. You may hear your own. Nobody knew then, of course, which of their names would afterwards become famous or notorious. Most of the names would never be heard of again. But each of them, even the mildest, the gentlest, the youngest, was living through a private, anonymous epic of his own, the venture of entering a strange world, another life. for trachoma which caused blindness and death. Trachoma meant certain rejection. When found in a child, it was a double tragedy. A parent would also have to turn back. It was only later that another immigrant, Hidayo Noguchi, found the cause that led to the cure of trachoma. Medical examination was the most harrowing stage of the Ellis Island gauntlet. By loading themselves with baggage, some tried to disguise a deformity or hide a limp from the inspectors. Immigrants with dangerous symptoms, physical or mental, were chalked with an X. It was the X that often made Ellis Island the Isle of Tears. It might lead to final rejection. For those who hadn't been X'd out, the immigration inspection was next. One who survived it called it a conveyor belt where the future Americans were kept moving along like puppets, cringing under the scrutiny of inspectors who held the fate of human beings in their hands. The immediate fate that confronted them all was a barrage of official questions. Where were you born? Where did you reside last? Who paid your passage? To whom are you going? Is anyone meeting you? Is that person in the United States? How long has he been here? Show us an address. Is that person working? 
How much money have you? Who gave you the money? Can you read and write? Can you count? All right, good luck to you. So, it was at Ellis Island that the Golden Door first swung wide. And there were 40 languages and a hundred ways to say, we made it. But no matter how many left the island, more kept pouring in. And Ellis, a city in itself, had to feed and bed and house them. Back in the Balkans, they had heard incredible tales of America where people ate white bread every day. And at Ellis, the marvels first came true. White bread and fresh milk and wonder of wonders, fresh fruit. You could be ticketed to any destination from the Ellis Railway Office. It was an international transfer point for Beth and Warsaw and Palermo to Buffalo and Pittsburgh and Chicago. America opened its gates to them as no nation had ever done. But they were not universally. Some thought America was becoming a dumping ground for Europe's rejects and outcasts. But it was an analyst of immigration who said, the strong-minded, the brave-hearted, the free and self-respecting come. The weak and timid stay home. In 1908, the poet Israel Zangwill coined a lasting phrase, the great melting pot where God is making the American. Germans and Frenchmen, Irishmen and Englishmen, Jews and Russians, into the crucible with you all. From this side of the registry hall, you can see that other island, Manhattan. It's only a mile away, but for the immigrant, that gap was the last barrier between dream and reality. A long voyage across the ocean would be futile until this little voyage was completed. New York meant America. They all came with a dream, and a boy from Syria named Salum Ritzik put his into words the kind of words that expressed what so many immigrants believed. America, the land of hope, the land of liberty, the land of plenty, where God poured out his wealth and the dreams of men come true. Frankitz Landet, the Swedes called it, the land of the future. To the Germans, it was das Land der unbegrenzten Möglichkeiten, the land of unlimited possibilities. Here at the tip of Manhattan, where millions first touched the mainland, the possibilities began. Possibilities, the bad with the good. Runners were waiting to pounce and steer them to overpriced rooming houses and work all sorts of swindles on the hapless and bewildered newcomers who were easy prey for dockside sharpers. The Lower East Side was the great catch basin of immigrants, bursting at the seams and bursting with vitality. Overwhelming, Salom Ritzik called it. An unbelievable jumble of people from everywhere. soon discovered that even in the promised land, the streets weren't paved with gold. And one of them recorded the shock of it. I shall never forget how depressed I became as I trudged through those littered streets with the rows of pushcarts, the deafening noise, the ill-smelling merchandise. So this was America. 
Most of them had come from farms and rural districts. But here, thousands swarmed into the cities, clustering together in tenements according to country, town, and even village of their origins. To many, English remained forever a foreign language, America a foreign country. In the melting pot, they remained unmelted. Sometimes, in the dinginess of the tenements, the ache for a sunny birthplace far away was never soothed. There was always the emotional tug between past and present, and the young, too, were caught in it. A girl named Ansia Yezierska lamented, I can't live with the old world, and I'm too green for the new. I'm one of the children of loneliness. But others said, yes, there is the strangeness and the weariness and sometimes the hunger. But above all, this is a country where God helps those who help themselves. So they worked, whole families together, for as little as six and a half cents an hour, 17 hours a day. Anything to get a foothold, to hang on, and to hope for the future. There was always that hope, the promise of America. If I never see the dream come true, my children surely will. Here, where everything was possible, that was possible too. Tomorrow would be better for the children. Many an immigrant who never learned reading and writing in the old country was determined that if nothing else, his children would learn to read and write in the new. It was no small part of the dream. In the schools, America began to shape them into citizens. From the schools, they would go out and shape America. This is the only country in the world, said Woodrow Wilson, which experiences this constant and repeated rebirth. It is constantly being renewed from generation to generation by the same process by which it was originally created. Other influences worked on them. The tenements and slums where gangs were spawned and crime was bred. The catch basin was a harsh and brutalizing environment for many of the children of loneliness. But the paradox was that out of the slums and ghettos came so much that brightened and colored the American scene. From the sons of immigrants, newsboys and street urchins, came the future troubadours and clowns and minstrels of the nation, the Eddie Cantors and Jimmy Durantes, the Jolsons and the Gershwins. Out of a dozen different national strains, they would weave some of the brightest strands in the American tapestry. One of them came all the way from Siberia by way of Ellis Island. As Irving Berlin, he grew up to write the song that could stand as the immigrant's tribute to his adopted land, God Bless America. <laughs> 